Thank you all for your patience. Sorry about that. So again, welcome to the April 2015 Food for Thought Education Series. Today we'll be discussing cyber liability. We'd like to thank you to our Food for Thought Education Series sponsor, Pinnacle Assurance, and our sponsor for today's session, Partner Colorado Credit Union. So we're going to ask you to hold your questions till the end. For those of you in the room, you'll just raise your hand. We'll repeat the questions so that those of you on the webinar and on the recording are able to hear the questions. For those on the um, webinar, you've been using the chat feature, so that's what you're going to use to ask your questions, and then we'll ask them for you. I'll now pass it off to Sean, who will get everything started. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. This is, of course, a complicated conversation. We are going to do our best to navigate through. Uh, thank you for my panelists for joining us. I'll introduce them uh, individually when appropriate. Uh, I will start the conversation off with just some baseline uh, discussion about cyber liability. Each of our panelists have their own respective expertise that they will uh, share with you all. And then uh, after each of our presentations, we'll have a discussion period both for online and here within the group for uh, specific questions uh, that come up as we go along through this. My name is Sean Tekken. I represent the Colorado Restaurant Insurance Agency. We have a lot of friends here in the room and online, so thank you for your support of the agency. We are, uh, of course, entering somewhat uncharted waters with this discussion. Small business in the past hasn't uh, needed to discuss cyber liability in its insurance portfolio, and that is changing. So uh, the discussion is relevant to the times, and, uh, and I think all of us, I thank all of us for spending some time to, to get into it. So as I kind of think about what cyber exposures are, uh, certainly this is very top line and, and we can get much farther into this, but, but we've got essentially third party liability where uh, being subject to a breach or a breach of information can affect third parties. Uh, we all as merchants with uh, contracts that we sign and some of the regulations that we have to abide with uh, have exposure. Uh, with what those contracts say and what those regulations say. Because of those contracts, because of those regulations, there are actions we as a merchant or retailer would have to take if we were uh, the subject of a breach. And so we're going to discuss a little bit what those actions are. And each of those actions, of course, have costs associated with them. So uh, we in business often like to reduce expense as much as we can. And so Understanding some of these components can hopefully help control costs and expense associated uh, if, if you were subject to cyber exposure. And then lastly, our true first party, those are those costs um, that, that would come with, with any breach. What are first party costs? They can be credit monitoring services that you're required to provide. Uh, they can be other services that are mandated by regulation. So uh, I believe each of our experts will share some of those first-party costs that uh, could become applicable. Third-party liability is not a huge component for, for, our, um, for our industry. We're not you know, holding medical records. We don't typically control credit records or anything like that. So, we don't have huge exposure here on third-party liability, but we certainly have some. If, uh, if we were to breach somebody's uh, financial records and they were to suffer fiduciary uh, exposure because of that, we could be held liable for that. So it's not as though there isn't any third-party liability. It might not be something as, as um, drastic to our industry as, as, say, the HIPAA regulations that affect uh, medical uh, industries and so forth. So that's the third party liability. Contractual obligations, um, you know, when I, when I look at that list on the bottom, we, we, you know, we agree to a lot of things that uh, we may or may not have the opportunity to read and understand those contracts. We sign contracts with our point of sale vendors, we sign them with credit card companies, we sign it with our merchant service providers. Um, we might have uh, website contracts or IT contracts that we also sign. So do we understand all of the exposure that we accept in those contracts and, and how each of those respective entities are going to respond 
if um, if you are uh, if you are subject to a breach. Um, and so, contractual obligations is certainly a big part of cyber uh, exposure. The second part of that is regulatory obligations. Uh, Ike's going to talk more about this, but this is essentially the list of, as I understand them, and I'm not sure it's a fully comprehensive list, but uh, what obligations you could be held accountable to for the um, cyber exposure that you have, and how do each of those regulatory <coughs> obligations mandate you to act or respond. Dave's going to talk a little bit about PCI compliance. PCI compliance were standards that were created by the credit card companies. Uh, and the fun thing about PCI compliance is that while you could be certified PCI compliant today, uh, changes occur quickly and you could be out of compliance uh, tomorrow. Changes to patches to um, security services, to software programs, um, stuff like that. The, uh, the important thing to know about PCI is that whether you are or are not compliant can affect what uh, contractual obligations you may be held accountable to. Does it affect any of the regulatory obligations I see at all? If you're not PCI compliant, you could be held liable for the loss. From the from from regulatory point of view? Yes. So both regulatory and uh, contractually, PCI compliance is a big factor in, in uh, cyber liability. And I'll let Gabe talk a little bit more in depth about uh, PCI compliance. Because of those contractual obligations, because of those regulatory obligations, what are some of the things we as retailers would have to do if we were subject to a breach? Um, and, and this is just some of the responses, and uh, James will talk a little bit of, about when um, your insurance comes into play, can it, if you have the appropriate insurance, can it help you with some of these things? So, uh, Banks may notify you, credit card companies may notify you that, um, that you've been subject to a breach and there are expected uh, practices for you to take. And so how familiar are we with those practices? How prepared are we to be able to respond? Lastly, what are your peers doing? Some of them are utilizing the old denial phase which is um, to rely on um, the fact that our point of sale provider takes care of us, our vendors take care of us. Um, I, I refer to that as the Superman complex, that uh, this isn't something that's going to happen to me. Uh, some of our peers are utilizing risk management, using uh, some tools to at least reduce some of the risk. And, uh, and then lastly, I think what could be also a good solution is insurance. So, of these three responses and solutions, this is kind of uh, how do we eat the elephant? Well, maybe we can take a look at some risk management tools. Maybe we can look, take a look at some insurance products and simplify somewhat of this complicated discussion. So, uh, as I thought about cyber liability and how I tend to view risk, there are various steps to the conversation. The first part of it is to identify the risk. Uh, the second steps are to try and manage the risk. And then thirdly, can we transfer any of the risk? And so each of my panelists are here to, to kind of uh, walk us through each of these, um, each of these components to do the risk management of cyber liability. I will start with introducing our first panelist, who I am very thankful he uh, joined us today. His name is Ike Barnes. He is with the Colorado Electronic Crimes Task Force. Uh, he actually is in charge of, of that division of the Secret Service. He is a West Point grad, and uh, he started his career 15 years ago with the New York Electronic Crimes Task Force. So um, thank you, Ike, for joining us, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Ike Barnes, and I'm, I'm with the Secret Service, uh, and so everything that uh, I talk to you about today is going to be from publicly available resources. Uh, these slides draw heavily from the, the 2015 Verizon Data Breach Report, uh, which you can get 
online for free. Uh, another uh, resource you can get online is uh, the, the Trust Wave uh, Global Security Report. Uh, Trust Wave is a, is a, late, a leader in, in forensics uh, nationwide, uh, worldwide, and so they, they publish a similar report. Uh, another resource that you can get for free is the Anti Phishing Working Group. Uh, this is just a, uh, a private uh, consortium, a nonprofit, and what they do is they research uh, trends in phishing uh, and they publish a quarterly newsletter. You can go to their website and sign up for that. Uh, I'll point to another couple of resources, SANS, S-A-N-S. SANS is a public-private consortium and they publish the 20 critical cybersecurity controls. So they talk about uh, what should you do to protect your networks. Um, and each of these, you know, 20 controls are, are very, uh, very effective. Um, now, dovetail those 20 critical security controls uh, with the 2014 Verizon Data Breach Report, and they talk about which industry you are and what the threat vector is that you need to be concerned about. Here, primarily, what we're talking about is point of sale intrusions, um, and so. They talk about which of the SANS defenses you should be most concerned with. Um, another framework you can use is the NIST framework. Uh, NIST is a, uh, is a part of the Department of Homeland Security, and they um, have published a cybersecurity framework uh, that a lot of the healthcare industry is now um, uh, mandated to use by some of the recent changes in the <laughs> um, So I'm with the Secret Service. Why am I here? Because we often think about uh, the president's, you know, presidential protection and 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 uh, and the guys in dark sunglasses. Um, and it, uh, um, on April the 14th of 1865, uh, President Lincoln signed us into existence because one third to one half of all currency in circulation was counterfeit. So um, he knew that a fledgling nation could not survive if they didn't have a sound financial system. Uh, anybody know what else is important about that day? That's the day he went to Fourth Theater and got shot, and he successfully died on April 15th. On July 9th of 1865, we were actually uh, uh, formally uh, created into existence, um, and so we are 150 years old, give or take. Um, and our mission is you know, protection of, of the nation's financial infrastructure, starting right there with the counterfeit currency. In uh, 1902, for you history buffs, uh, we had three presidents who were either assassinated or attempted to be assassinated in 30-some-odd years. So the Congress decided, you know what? Maybe we should do something about that, and that's when we picked up the Presidential Protection Mission. But I'm here to talk about uh, securing uh, the nation's financial infrastructure. That is, that's our, that's our primary investigative focus. So with that, uh, in 2014, there was roughly 79,000 uh, breaches. Um, of those, uh, those different incidents, excuse me, those, those are incidents, those aren't confirmed breaches, um, that ranges from the loss of data to just an anomaly because government agencies are, are required to report on every incident they have, uh, which makes that number you know, seem uh, overwhelming when you compare it to the 2,000 uh, confirmed data breaches. Talk about 573 small businesses that were breached, um, and these are small businesses. Uh, but when you, when you rank this up to the medium-sized uh, business, 75% uh, uh, were a medium to small size business that were affected by the breach. A lot of times we think, ah, the bad guys don't want to bother with me because I'm just a little fish. Uh, what I would pose to you is, in fact, the bad guys are probably targeting you more than they're targeting uh, the larger corporations. And the reason is they don't think you are savvy enough and have the defenses in place to protect your customers' financial payment card data. And this is what they're going after. Why financial payment card data? Because it's easily monetized. I can steal your credit card data, your customer's credit card data, and then I can go to the web internet and I can create a form, an online form, to resell that data. Um, and, you know, I think uh, the last time I checked, one credit card number is about uh, between $1 and $5. And some of these vendors uh, allow us to choose uh, country, location, type of card, so if I want a card right here from Denver, Colorado, and I want it to be an Amex card, I can go on drop-down menu, and I can buy 100 Amex cards uh, for a price. Now, a lot of these bad guys also have a customer service uh, uh, component to them, so that if you buy a card and it doesn't subsequently work, 
they'll give you a, a replacement free of charge. They too are customer service oriented <laughs> just as you are. They're businessmen. Um, though criminals. Uh, Eighty-five percent of uh, of all the threats are external. Um, and, and what we're talking about is external to your organization. The other 15% are internal things that oftentimes we can put measures in to control. Um, for instance, you shouldn't have any dormant accounts on your systems. If you have a dormant account, you allow the ability for a former employee who doesn't really care anymore, who still has a password, and they let that password go, and now somebody can remote access into your system. So those are, those are your your threats. Also, if you have dormant accounts or you have accounts with weak uh, names, one of my favorites is admin, says admin, administrator, uh, that guy's those are the most popular accounts. And so if they're looking around, they're going to start targeting accounts with those types of names. They also know what the top 100 passwords are. If you can go to the, go online and Google the top 100 passwords, uh, right up there at the top, password one. Uh, another one, PS symbol, SSWRD one. Right? These are the most common passwords. So bad guys are exploiting those common usernames and those common passwords to get in. The other piece they're exploiting is they're exploiting unpatched systems. In over 99% of the attacks last year, it was as a result of patches not being in place for something that was patched over a year old. We often hear about zero-day exploits. and what is it, uh, you know, we're concerned because about the unknown, but I would offer to you that it's the known that's more concerning because we aren't patching our system. We aren't using automatic system updates. So patch your system, use the automatic system update so that you have the most current uh, defenses. 60% uh, of the case, the attacker is able to compromise an organization within minutes. Why is that? Again, weak password, weak username. Um, so this is, uh, this is what it is. Now, uh, the bad guys, on average, are in your system for 221 days. Um, and the reason they're in your system for 221 days is so they can grab as much data as possible. What they have learned from their own mistake is uh, one of the major breaches of a major retailer last year. They immediately began selling those card, card numbers online. And so as they were immediately selling those card numbers online, uh, law enforcement, banking industry, uh, other uh, groups uh, were able to, to determine where these cards were coming from, and that vectored us in. And so we stopped that breach in a very short period of time, though there was a tremendous number of customers just due to the size of the retail organization that were compromised. Having said that, bad guys are now allowing that to run longer and longer so they can collect your data more, so they have more data to sell. So. Something to think about. 70% of the breaches are related to the retail segment, and they occur through the point of sale. Uh, why is that? Again, I'm a bad guy. I'm looking for the low-hanging fruit. I'm going to look for the easiest data that I can then turn and monetize. And the easiest data is credit card data. Uh, other data that's very valuable to me is Social Security numbers, dates of birth. Um, I'm also very interested in um, your banking records, your vendor's banking records, because you're paying your vendors oftentimes online. So if I can get that, uh, that's that's very pleasing to me. Uh, we worked a we worked a case uh, where a uh, large uh, oil oil corporation that was um, uh, centered here in uh, in, in Denver um, had their uh, banking information compromised. Uh, bad guys went in and grabbed all of the payment data for all of the customers that the oil company was, was paying, and then now they had vectors to get into those customers' bank accounts because we knew where to start from. So this is other data that we try to monetize. Um, in order to do this, I've got to put some sort of malware, and malware is nothing more than malicious software, bad software, onto your system. Um, what we saw a few years ago is it was some sort of keylogger. And a keylogger is nothing more than it's capturing every keystroke that's typed into the computer. Now what we see more and more often is what's called a RAM scraper. So anything that's out in the RAM that's going on with your computer, that's what it's, it's taking. And it's trying to scrape that off the system. What it does then is it then amalgamates that data and then it exports that data. Okay? And we can do that in a couple different frames. Uh, couple of different ways. Uh, one of the things I've seen used is your own email system used against you. And we amalgamate the payment card data 
and we send it out in from your email. Uh, another thing I've used, seen is uh, what's called a secure socket layer connection. I've seen text files to FTP servers. Um, I mean, the range is is is, is uh, immense, but we have to get in, we have to amalgamate the data, and then we have to get out. Um, larger breaches tend to be a multi-step attack. How did, what are we talking about here? Well, if you have a, a system that is fairly well secured, it is fairly well locked down, but I can then begin to exploit the data that you have published yourself online, I can now begin to target you, and I'll talk about phishing a little bit later, but I can begin to target you with phishing emails because of what we provided our, ourselves out there. So they get in now on your system, and then they begin to move laterally throughout your whole network. So that's what we're talking about. 27.3% uh, of chance card skimmers take weeks or months to discover. Again, back to, to the first point. 36% uh, take days to discover. Um, and this is, uh, this is a good news story, right? This is because you all are looking at your systems and scanning your systems, or you have IT professionals here scanning your systems. But unfortunately, um, majority of the time, 67% uh, of the time, roughly, um, it's law enforcement. It's the banking industry. It's one of your customers who contacts you and says, hey, I think maybe I've been skimmed. And that's when, that's when you find out, and that's when you can begin to mitigate. So different types of attacks. Um, the bad guys are going to use whatever the most effective method is to get into your system. Inadvertent sharing of information and passwords. Uh, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. How many of you have a system that just has one user account and one password on it that you allow all of your employees to access? Um, so you're sh sharing passwords that way. Or perhaps you share your password uh, with a trusted employee to have them go do something for you because you're not there on the system that needs to be done. Um, so that's sharing of the password. And then maybe the password gets written down somewhere and lost. Uh, I can tell you that if we go into most any corporation in America today, because of the password complexity requirements, uh, you're going to see passwords written down under keyboards, under mouse pads. Uh, it's where we, where we hide them because they're complex. Or we put them on our phones. And we don't have a, a vault locker on the application on the phone to secure the password. So when we leave our password line or we leave our phone lying around, we've just left all our passwords lying around. How many people would, how many women in particular, would get up and go to the restroom in a restaurant and leave your purse? No, right? How many would get up and leave your phone sitting on the table? That number goes up dramatically. What I would offer to you is what's more valuable. Oftentimes, the information you have in that phone is far more valuable than the information you would have in your purse. So, um, something to think about. Phishing. Phishing works. Uh, Verizon did a study two years ago. They sent out um, emails just to see how long it took for someone to click on a link. If I send three emails to two people, a total of six emails, I've got an 80% chance that at least in one of those emails, somebody clicked on a link. Why is that? Because we're trained to click on links, right? Everybody here probably has their favorite retailer. They get uh, emails from everybody here probably has some sort of news feed they get emails from. And we um, click on that link because if, from the retailer, it takes me right to the page for the widget they're advertising. It also uh, puts the special code for free shipping or the discount or whatever it may be into the website and it's easy. Same with the news, news feed, right? Oh, that article looks interesting. I click on the link and it takes me there. Um, we're trained to do it. We do it often. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it says 11% click through, but that attributes to 91% of the attacks and that's a, a stat uh, that was recently published by FireEye. So, Something to, uh, something to consider, and I implore you, please, don't click on links. Another beautiful thing, I mean, we're seeing very, very, very sophisticated phishing emails. Um, you posted on your, on your Facebook account that last night you had dinner with Joe, and you went to such and such a restaurant. Now, I send you an email, spoofing Joe's email address, and I say, hey, it was really great, and I really appreciate you taking me to that 
restaurant. It's the first time I've been there. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to go back there in the future. And you know, you were talking. We were talking about thus and such while we were there. And hey, here's something. And I send you a link to an article, or I send you a, um, a document, right? Uh, and I, you click on that, and suddenly now you have malware on your system. So um, these phishing campaigns are very, very complex. And I implore you, unless you're 100% positive that you know where something came from, don't click on any link. Make sure you scan any attachments coming into your system. Vulnerable networks. Uh, again, we're using uh, very, very common passwords. We're using very, very common administrator names. Um, doesn't really matter what your administrator name is, but I would implore you not to make it administrator. Make it your dog's name, as long as your dog's name isn't on your social networking site. Um, and passwords. While we're talking about that, uh, We've been using eight to 16 digit passwords for quite some time. Uh, and we started to use special characters and we started to use upper and lower case. And those are pretty good passwords. But what I'm going to uh, recommend today is talking about pass phrases. My favorite pass phrase. I love my dog buster exclamation point. I believe that's somewhere around 21 characters. Okay, now I put a number letter substitution. I make a three and eight. And then I, maybe I alternate upper and lower case. Um, and so now I've made these passwords exponentially harder to crack. There are password crackers that you can go online, Google password cracker, and you can find uh, results for it. Okay? So the bad guys are using these things as well. So something to consider. The longer the password, if only you're using letters and numbers, you've now made it 36 times more difficult to crack each character you add. So now you start to put special characters in there, and you can see how exponentially your password is going to get stronger. Um, malware. We talked about the competition of malware. It's going to have some sort of ramscaper, it's going to have some sort of amalgamator, and then it's going to exfiltrate. Uh, you have persistent malware and you have non-persistent malware. What we've seen in some of these systems was you, you find the malware, you delete it, and it's persistent enough that it will reinstall it. Sometimes if you delete it, you don't. So, uh, something to consider. Denial of service attacks. Uh, this is a attack uh, that is going to be directed at you because we want to cause you some sort of financial loss or we want to um, bring down your website for whatever reason that may be. Uh, the, uh, the way it works is I am a bad guy and I have infected all of these thousands of computers around the world with, and I've created what's called a bot network. And so there's a piece of software on, on somebody's PC and now I tell it, attack your website. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to make a specific request for a specific page. And so I activate all of these millions of computers I've got, and now I'm hitting your website all at one time with the same request. Your website is going down. That's how it works. Um, internet and uh, web applications. Uh, you have to make sure that these are segregated. And this is, I'm going to uh, foray into uh, the point of sale system. And I understand everybody here is deeply involved in how these systems work, but please bear with me. From your point of sale, it's going to go to what's typically a back of the house server. From the back of the house server, it's going to go to your card processor. From your card processor, ultimately, it's going to get to the bank. The bank's going to say approved or disapproved, and it's going to come back to your point of sale system. That system is no different than, remember the old manual card swiper, right? The only thing you would ever use that thing for is, making an imprint of a credit card. I, I tell you that your point of sale system should only be used for point of sale transactions for the very same reason. That is the design purpose use of equipment. As soon as I start hosting web applications on it, as soon as I start doing my books on it, as soon as I start doing social media on it, as soon as I start allowing people access to it, I am opening myself up to risk. Uh, we worked a case here uh, on the front range, a uh, a um, gentleman owned 100 franchises. And with those franchises, he had a very, very good security as a general rule and all the systems locked down but one. And then somebody came into one of his restaurants and one of his employees urgently needed to update their social networking status and say, look who I just saw. And so while they were on there, they saw a link to their social networking page they hadn't seen before. They decided, ah, I'm going to click on that link. That took him to one other web page, and then there was a link on that page that looked interesting to them. 
they clicked on that link. Now there was malware installed on that system. Now, unfortunately, uh, the franchise owner didn't have lateral defenses in place, which he now does. But it enabled the malware to laterally move across his entire franchise. All because one system, unsecured, three clicks, one employee. Um, this is how, how uh, important that is. Uh, payment card skinners. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, this is about a physical uh, attack here at this point in time. Um, what we have seen is it's not exceptionally prevalent, but it is it, it does have its appearances. Is uh, someone walks into your uh, business and says, "Today and today only, I'm going to upgrade your point of sale system that costs 1,500 to 2,500 bucks a piece, roughly, for free, and it's going to allow you to." Process green dot cards, or it's going to allow you to recharge mobile uh, prepaid cards, or whatever. And you look at it, and you say, you know what? This is something not really an avenue I'm interested in, but maybe it's I can earn a little bit of extra money that way. It's not going to cost me anything, so you do it. Little beknownst to you uh, is that uh, POS system has been compromised with skimming data inside, and I can even put Bluetooth data inside of that. And so every time you swipe one of those cards. The bad guys are automatically physical attack getting that. Now, the other beautiful thing about this is you then, in turn, give your old POS system to the bad guy. It costs you $1,500 to $2,500. And the bad guy then alters that one and goes right next door to the next business and offers the same deal. So, um, you know, know your vendor. The same can be uh, 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 applied to phishing scams, uh, voice phishing, social engineering. Uh, whatever you want to call it, where I pick up the phone and say, hey, I am your payment card processor. Uh, I just want to do a quick system update on your system. Uh, can you uh, give me your password so I can get in? Right? Uh, know who your vendors are and understand that those calls can happen, but make sure that you're talking to who you think you're talking to. Uh, employee theft. Um, with the employee theft, it goes right back to the, uh, the dormant accounts that, that uh, we had an employee who did have access to it, and now we've left that account dormant on our system, and now they can remote in and gain access that way. Uh, brute force attack, uh, this goes right back to the password security aspect. Regulatory obligations. I'm not going to talk about each, each one of these, but what I am going to talk about is uh, we need to make sure that we are being proactive in this. And when someone calls you and says, hey, I'm from the Secret Service or I'm from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and we think you've been breached, we probably aren't making that up, right? Now, <laughs> we're, we're probably calling you just to set up an appointment because I'm not going to try to get into your system remotely. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> but um, please take it seriously. Uh, we had a, a, a restaurant right here in Denver uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, we developed intelligence that uh, it was breached uh, on my Colorado Electronic Crimes Task Force, and I failed to talk about the scope of this, but I've got members from um, Arapahoe County. I've got members from the Colorado Bureau of Investigations. I've got members from La Plata County, Mesa County. We, we, we spread the state, Weld County, Larimer County, so we're all over the state. So they may call you up and say, I'm with such and such, I want to come in. Well, this, this company said, uh, yeah, we don't think we have a problem, but just in case, they actually called their, their payment processor who looked in their system and said, oh, you know what? They've got Python malware, which is just a type of malware, it's a RAM scraper, uh, on their system. So they wiped their system and reset it and said, oh, you're good to go. So now my investigator from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation shows up the next day, read upon appointment time, and says, hey, can I image your system? And they said, oh, well, we, we called up our, our payment card processor and they took care of it. We don't have a problem anymore. Well, guess what? I now have no investigative leads to go help find the bad guy. Um, so uh, please, please, please don't do that. Call early, call often. If you hear you've been breached, if you've been suspected you've been breached, call. If you want to verify somebody's identity, call the main number of whatever law enforcement entity it is uh, that's published in the phone book. Um, and, and verify who they are. Uh, and I would implore you to do that. It's, it's a very good thing. And when they show up, ask for identity. But please allow us access to the system so that we can do this. And with that, uh, as you set your systems up, enable file 
cataloging. That's probably the most important piece of forensic uh, evidence that I'm going to use because it's going to tell me when something was accessed and how it was accessed. Okay? So, as, as me or any internet security company who's doing forensics is going to come in and look, that's what we're looking for first to help us out. Now, once I've found the malware, I can uh, do some analysis with it uh, through uh, entities like US CERT, uh, and it'll help us, you know, tie malware together and figure out where, you know, the system, where it may be coming from, and, and that helps as well. But I need to be able to uh, see what files are on your system. The average cost for a breach is estimated between $52,000 and $87,000. Um, so, just something to, to consider as I'm as I'm wrapping up. And Sean, yep. Thank you, Ike. Um, I think that if anything is a comprehensive view of identifying what's out there um, and what's going on, I. I Christy with the agency sat through a traveler seminar and I believe the statistic they shared is 60% of small businesses who are subject to a breach close within six months. So we want to uh, do our part at the association and the insurance agency to kind of change that trend. So uh, our next two panelists really are, are talking about managing the risk and what, what uh, little pieces can we take to kind of eat the elephant as, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, my next speaker is Gabe Medrano. He's the owner of uh, IT uh, Consulting and Support Company that specializes in helping restaurants. The company is the Medrano Group. Gabe has been in IT for 15 years. He's previously worked with Hewlett Packard and um, as a in-house IT specialist with Rio Grande Restaurants. So thank you, Gabe, and thank you from here on how to manage the risk. All right. So I alluded to a few of these, but I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about these. How can you manage those risks? So the first is uh, hardware software security. Um, so the first, the first thing I would talk about is, as I alluded to, is the point of sale devices are for point of sale. Um, what this means is uh, only allow applications related to your point of sale on that on that device. What this also means is set up a separate machine for your day-to-day -day, um, office work. Um, I, I call them Facebook machines because we all know your, your management staff is going to be surfing the web. So just keep it separate. Um, a $200 machine is, uh, is not much of a price to pay for a breach. Um, the other thing uh, I alluded to was out-of-date security, or uh, excuse me, out-of-date software. So we're talking about the Windows XP. The, um, if you're running that, you, you need to <laughs> you need to talk to um, um, you know, and then patches. We can talk about the patches themselves. Um, another point that I like to bring up is, um, yes, antivirus is definitely important. Those are the known, known uh, um, malware viruses out there. That's called blacklisting. Uh, what I like to talk about is the whitelisting side of it, and that is only very specific applications are allowed to run on your machine. So anything new wouldn't be able to run. So that's, that would keep the malware in theory, at bay. Um, network security. This is this is the basics. You know, make sure you have a firewall. Make sure your modem is set up with uh, not the default passwords. You know, I can I can log into a lot of Comcast Central modems by using default passwords. Um, also, make sure your your network is segregated. Um, your point of sale network shouldn't be sharing shouldn't be on the same um, network as your guest network or your Wi-Fi for that matter. Um, you want to segregate your network. Uh, I think we touched on the password utilization, uh, strong passwords, not sharing passwords, individual accounts, um, obviously different passwords for different, um, very different applications. Uh, we touched on that. Data storage, uh, that real quick is keep an eye on what, what you actually keep on, on those machines. So, um, there's the obvious stuff like your, your uh, financials, your banking, but also think about your employee records. Your employee records have social security numbers, have the birthdays that um, we alluded to earlier. So uh, make sure that's under lock and key. And the last is um, the people management, the behavior. 
Um, I, I won't go into the fishing, but that's exactly what I'm, I'm referring to. Know your vendors. Um, make sure that no, no reputable um, vendor is going to ask you for your passwords, no matter what they say. Um, so make sure you, you, your staff understands that. I mean, everybody here probably wouldn't allow that. But make sure your host or your hostess knows not to give out passwords. Now, who's to say a host or hostess would have access to anything? Uh, that's another story. Um, next, uh, the other the other big thing to mitigate your risk is the PCI compliance. How many people have heard of PCI compliance? Yeah. Um, so what this is is this uh, started by the payment card industry. Um, the very basic uh, base level recommendation I have is get started on your self assessment. Self assessment could be done by yourself or it could be uh, some outside help. But at least at the very least, get started on that. Um, I'm going to move forward and take a time. Um, so there are 12 steps to this PCI compliance with six basic um, um, uh, the six basic key principles. I'm not going to read them all to you, but um, so for instance, build and maintain a secure network and systems, protect cardholder data, maintain a vulnerability management program, implement strong access control measures. Uh, and regular, regularly monitor and test your networks and maintain an information security policy. Um, if you need help with this, um, I know payment processors are more than more than willing to help. Uh, there's consultants out there. There's you know your IT, maybe your IT departments, IT manager can help. But at the very least, get started with this. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these processing companies will also provide the monitoring services for you. So once you do your self-assessment, you feel like you, you know, you've passed that, then your next step is to be continually uh, monitored and have intrusion detections. Um, so what's, what are the challenges here? Well, first, um, as we all know, it's cost. Um, um, so moving, migrating from Windows XP, your point of sale from Windows XP to uh, Windows 7. Um, hiring somebody, if you don't know this, if you don't know this stuff, you're going to need to um, hire somebody to help you with this. These are known costs, but I, I promise you it's, it's definitely worth it. Time. Um, going back to that self-assessment, how many of you really have time to do your own self-assessment? You know, you're running a restaurant, you're paying your employees, whatnot. And that's one more thing um, that you're going to have to be conscious of is that you need to make time for this. Uh, training. Uh, whether it's whether it's in terms of um, new processes, um, the new card readers, um, training training your your guests, you know, depending on depending on how you do your credit card processing now, if you down the road when you get table side credit card readers, um, it's going to be awkward for for them to put a tip in while the, the server's there. Right? So those kinds of those kinds of things. Um, efficiency. Nobody really wants to slow down the service at the restaurants. We all understand that. So how do how do we make sure that we're not slowing the process down of people getting their food, getting their drinks, paying, getting out of the restaurant? And then of course, the just the evolving evolving technology. Um, it's hard to keep up. Um, reach out to again, reach out to your vendors, reach out to your uh, your IT staff to make sure you're current. Um, and I think that's. Okay, so um, how many <laughs> um, how many people have heard of October 15th? Uh, yeah. So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there, but in essence, the, the chip and pin uh, mandate is going in for cards. Um, uh, so the word of caution is that there there is still you know poor implementations. Just because you you know I I, I just spoke on PCI compliance. You can be PCI compliant and still get hacked. Um, Home Depot, Target were both PCI compliant. So it's a matter of just staying current. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but these changes that are coming put more liability on merchants. So, so keep that in mind. So. David, as I understand that, uh, and I, if you want to join in on, on this discussion, but 
uh, as I understand these changes, essentially the banks and the credit card companies have agreed that uh, the, the language within their contract and the expectations with their partners are that we adopt this higher level of security and technology by October, starting October of 2015. And uh, if I do not, whoever is the weakest link in the chain can essentially absorb the liability. So if I'm understanding this correctly, if my bank has, uh, has embraced chip technology in the card and my merchant has not, and they're simply still swiping the card, then they have the lesser technology and it's my merchant in that fraudulent transaction that can be held liable. Do, you, do we all have agreement that that's kind of the expectation of the changes? Yes, and there's one other piece I'd like to add to this is, is I understand you're all in a customer service industry, right? And you want to keep your customers happy. Uh, well, a very uh, small uh, retail store that was up in Boulder uh, recently uh, sold $15,000 in merchandise uh, to somebody who walked in. And this uh, client walked in and they uh, asked all the right questions and and they seemed very interested in this, and the store owner, the business owner, was very, very happy to get this sale because fifteen thousand dollars he wouldn't be, right? Uh, so he goes to swipe the card using the Mac Stripe, and it doesn't work. Uh, the customer says, "Oh, uh, I've been meaning to get to the bank and get a new card issued, but if you look at the back and see it's all scratched up, can you just key punch that transaction in for me?" And so the business owner trying to be very customer service oriented, he punched the transaction in. Well, that $15,000 transaction came back as fraudulent, and the business owner is liable for the merchandise that's lost. Okay, so it's something to consider, customer service versus security. If you bypass whatever the security is, then you yourself are gonna be liable for that transaction. And so a lot of that liability comes more in play in October and, and gave, as I understand this correctly, to, to embrace this new hardware, there's a cost and I, and I know that a lot of the point of sale providers and we might have some in the room that might know this answer, but do we have an understanding of the hardware costs associated with the equipment? Yeah, I'm, I'm agnostic as far as point of sale uh, and credit card processing for that matter, but yeah, there is going to be a cost. Um, and the terminal itself, depending, you know, we mentioned $1,200, $1,800. The card swipers themselves start at $300. So, I mean, you guys can do the math. There's going to be some cost incurred. All right. Uh, with that, if I understand that some uh, card processors and banks are providing uh, equipment upgrades free of charge, not <laughs> all, but some, uh, to, to help facilitate small businesses with this uh, transition. Would you like to chime in in the process? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You might come in afterwards. You can correct me if I say anything wrong. Sure. Okay. All right. So, um, and I'll make it short because I don't want to dig into the time. But essentially, what you've got in October 15th is chip and pin. We don't have pin in this country, which is stupid, but I won't go there. Um, I'm serious. Europe's had this for 10 years. But essentially, what the chip is, is the chip's on the cards. It's how you read that card. The new equipment that's coming out has a, you have to slide it into uh, a, a receiver. And that's what reads the chip. Now, POS systems have got all kinds of different programming behind them. So your processor has to have a, um, uh, an interface or a compatible program with the POS system so that the reader that you're using, and you're going to end up getting these readers from people like Verifone, possibly some of the processors themselves. We're talking about POS systems now, not standalone. So you're going to have to be looking at that um, with your POS system. So you've got to work together with the, with the processor and the POS system. The very simple way to do it, and if you've got a hundred restaurants you're not doing this, is you get a terminal. Um, and the new terminals are anywhere from $200 up depending on what you want. Also what's coming too is contactless readers, which is what your iPhone is. So, or your, does Droid have a? I don't think they have, right. So iPhone is Apple Pay or Google Wallet, those things. Those are contactless readers. So that's what you're looking at in equipment. 
but it, it, it's going to take a while. Um, we were just at a conference in March, and they said, you know what, the magnetic stripe is not going away in our lifetime, which is a shame. Uh, Europe is 10 years in front of us, and, and I've talked to people that come back from Europe, and there are places they won't even take your card if you don't have a chip. So I uh, hope that addresses your POS. <laughs> so change is coming. Uh, expect uh, there was an article in our last newsletter uh, addressing it as well. So it's it's important to stay on top of that, and we'll continue to share uh, pertinent information regarding that. And lastly, uh, I hope even more good news because insurance always likes to be good news. Is uh, I want to address how can I transfer the risk? So what are some uh, steps I can take as a, as a business owner to, to transfer the risk to an insurance company. Um, what uh, I want to introduce, what I, who I'd like to introduce last is James Sue, who is joining us from CRC Insurance. And James has spent um, all of his 22 year career on professional liability. And cyber liability falls into that same category of uh, insurance policy forms. James and what he specializes in is now coming into our small business world more than it has before. So uh, we're evolving in, uh, in our industry with the risks that are uh, also evolving. So the insurance industry is evolving with the risks uh, that, that uh, small business is now facing. James has, um, for 22 years that he's been in professional liability, helped design earlier cyber liability forms. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us and if you could give us a quick overview on transferring the risk to the insurance company. Thank you. Hi. So now that you guys are complete experts on cyber liability <laughs> and how to stop it and what to look for, right? So you'll never have a breach, right? Exactly. You can always count on a breach, I think, and, and that's where the risk transfer portion comes in because you can't prepare for everything. I've seen all those commercials where when you prepare and you see all the commercials and farmers' commercials and you have a big tree trunk drop on your car and you're like, okay, I'll be prepared for that. Cyber liability, unfortunately, is a similar realm uh, when it comes to insurance and risk transfer. Um, I wanted to go back just a little bit and talk about a little bit of history of cyber liability. Yeah. History of cyber liability, just a little bit. Cyber liability actually has been around something like 20, 22 years. Uh, it's not something new. It didn't just occur out of nowhere. Cyber liability actually began uh, as an errors and emissions coverage to cover professionals like Gabe. Uh, and they called it cyber liability or technology related liability coverages. And it was specifically geared to professionals like Gabe. Uh, it wasn't anywhere near what now we kind of look at in terms of retail and social media and, and multimedia and so on and so forth. But that's where it began. And as it progressed and things became more and more prevalent as computer became part of our everyday life, um, just like iPhones and the new iWatch where you have wearable technology, where technology is ingrained into our lives in so many different ways, uh, the risk became more and more prevalent because they weren't targeting people like Gabe anymore. They're targeting people like us who rarely deal with these issues on a day to day basis. So the risk transfer, uh, transfer portion comes in because, because of the liability that, that occurred, a lot of these other policies that you may carry, like a general liability policy, everybody carries a general liability policy, right? Or maybe a director and officer's coverage may have some portions where if you're making decisions, may get covered under that, but not fully. Uh, errors and emissions coverages in your industry, they're very rare. <laughs> there is not really an e &I exposure. And then crime coverages apply to maybe like a wire transfer for a fraud if you need to do something like that, but it really doesn't address the issues and the exposures that a uh, cyber liability does. So back 20 years again, the term cyber liability and, and technology liability was prevalent for maybe the last 15 years. In the last five to seven years, a new term came up, privacy and security in our world, in the insurance industry. 
Is it the same? Yes and no. A lot of carriers were trying to fumble through the idea of what is cyber, what is privacy and security, what is security, what is privacy, and so on and so forth. So they've kind of coined this term called privacy and security so that it encompasses and comes into play and tries to cover and mitigate risks for people, like, everyday people like us and not for technology gurus like Gates, for example. So in a, in a cyber liability policy, there are, I mean, two. Cyber liability coverages or privacy and security coverages have two portions to them. And we'll go into details on the two portions. But cyber liability's good thing is it really does address all of the exposures under your security system, under your internet system, not just on the net, but even hard, hard information like files. I don't know, some people may keep, and I've seen it at medical offices, and you guys aren't medical, but I've seen hard files still stacked right behind the counter, so they're all hard files. When you address privacy and security issues, we're talking about all records, not just net, network secured records. So we're looking at a more holistic version of what we're trying to cover versus what is not covered. The bad thing um, is that there's about 40 different carriers with about 80 different policy forms with about five different ways to rate a cyber liability policy. Uh, and the ins and outs of why they do that, every day, every day is a debate between the underwriters and the brokers like Sean and myself. And we talk about why is it rated that way? Is it based off of revenues? Is it based off, based off of number of records kept? What is the number of records kept? Is it just a name? Is it all piece of data? Or is that, are we doing it by and limiting it to the limit of liability as a dollar amount? Or do we limit it to the number of records that you guys keep? And so on and so forth. So to keep that just keep going on and on and on. Every year, there is a cyber forum for the insurance folks that we get together. And, and that takes up literally 50% of our discussion of why things are rated the way it is. But it is. So navigating through this policy, navigating through what is covered through the policy, is a, is a difficult task in itself. Um, it takes a lot of my weekends. My wife loves it. And, but it, we do what we do it as, you know, as part of our job. So under the, under the coverages, privacy and security coverages, on both privacy side and as well as the security side, we have something called first and third party coverage. And very easily, first party coverages are things that will come out of your direct pocket. That will affect your business on a day-to-day -day basis. If something were to happen, how would that affect your business, your pocket, your checkbook, you know, and, and the way your, your business runs in the future? Third-party coverages covers anything that is financially lost to somebody has what, that was not part of your business. So it doesn't come out of your pocket, well, eventually it will, but like a patron is a third party. Um, maybe in an instance of uh, a privacy breach, maybe your employee information, social security number, why you take your employee's information on an on a, on a employee application, maybe that's a breach. And those things are considered third party loss, where they, that information is taken and as you know, we heard earlier, is sold on the black market and it creates a financial loss to those individuals, third party individuals, in return will bring back to, to you to get restitution for their loss. So on a first party uh, exposure coverage, we're looking at failure of security and a failure of um, to secure privacy data. Those are two major things we're looking at. When you fail to do either one, not go back. When you fail to prevent and secure privacy data, there is a whole slew of regulatory uh, things that come into play, and where you're you're responsible for those. And a lot of times, you know, I've heard so many times people say, you know, my customers come back and they say, oh, it's okay, I don't need to carry one, all my vendors carry one, it's okay, and they're covering, and they say you don't have to worry, you know, I'm covered under the policy, and so on and so forth, and that's not the case. Risk does not transfer from your responsibility to your vendor's policy if the breach happens on your premises, on your system. Okay, so there, that's, that's a misnomer, and people should really understand that that's not how it works. In 
terms of uh, uh, a security breach, failure to secure your network system, those are things that where you get hacked in and you proliferate viruses and malware and things that go through your system into other systems. Emails that come through your system and is passed on to somebody else and creating somebody else's loss in their system. But they trace it back to yours as the originator, then you're responsible. So under the uh, insurance or risk tra transfer categories, there are several policies and several exposures you can cover. And some of those are delineated here. BI here and business, business in interruption here refers to uh, your loss of business income due to a hacker getting into your system and shutting down your system. And so it, and, and, and that creates a loss for you as a competitive. Theft of data, theft of funds, um, and services, those are all covered under those policies as well. We're talking about first party coverage as a breach, breach cost. Every, every state got their breach regulatory um, uh, requirements, and many states require that you notify clients uh, when there is breach, breach. Recently, you know, I have my healthcare insurance through Blue Cross Blue Shield. I don't know if, if you guys do, but I just got a letter. I got a letter, my daughter, two daughters got a letter. My wife got a letter saying that they've been breached and that that they've uh, compromised exactly the social security number, name, address, so on and so forth. They did say they didn't get our um, uh, credit card information and things like that, but they did get all this other information. They were very specific on what they did get. So when you get one of those letters, there's a cost associated with sending out one of those letters. Uh, currently, the cost associated with sending out a breach letter uh, letting notify people is somewhere between about $180 to $210 per record. So I know you guys have customers come through your restaurant all day. Can you imagine how many records that go through your, your system? Then you do your math and you can see what can be the possible loss coming out of those uh, requirements. And those are all first party costs out of your pocket costs that you have to send to. That includes credit monitoring, that includes forensic experts, that trying to find out where the breach happened, whether it happened from your side or somebody else's side, whether it was a rogue employee that happens to, before swiping, write down or swipe down the customer's card information and takes it, whatever the instance may be, um, uh, the cost associated with mitigating or, or notifying these, these breaches is about $210. On the third party ex uh, exposure, we're talking about uh, what we talked about earlier, which is your cost uh, when one of your clients' information is, is compromised and they use that information to gain financial gain. So credit card information is a great example. Your social security number, somebody takes your social security number, uses it to get a line of credit. Now you're out a certain amount or somebody gets into your checking account and you have $15,000 in there. Three days later, you got zero. Those are all breaches that happens to others if it happens through your, your, your place of business. So, uh, mitigating risk, um, yes, it's great, you know, we've got great IT people that can help you, consultants that can help you like Gates. Uh, insurance helps provide and pay for a lot of that risk management. What do you do? You get hacked. I, I don't know what to do. Do I call Gates? Do I call, who do I call? How do I, Sean? Well, you can call the carrier, and the carrier's got risk mitigating companies that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis. You can reach their hotline and then they'll walk you through every step on what to do, how to report it, how to mitigate it, to call, how to hire somebody, or if they want, if you want to use their uh, IT people, then they come out and they'll help you with that as well. They'll get the right forensic experts to come in and figure out where the breach happened so that you're not kind of like left holding the bag and don't know what to do. You just want somebody to walk you through these process. And if you buy, buy a risk transfer mechanism such as this policy, They'll help you through that whole process from beginning to end so that you're pretty secure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as I kind of try to understand all of this um, in, in talking to some people who've been through some parts of this, you, you know, you, you can quickly find yourself in a situation, uh, as Ike mentioned, where, where somebody calls you to notify that something's occurred. And uh, you, you might have, 
your POS system that sends somebody out. You, you might have your, your merchant service provider that sends somebody out. Uh, if, if it was a credit card breach, I understand PCI will send out a forensic investigator. I believe PCI's investigations, by the way, are, are not are binding and not subject to arbitration. So if they do whatever they those investigators find could significantly impact you. Uh, it could be banks contacting you. How many of those people are your friends? How many are there to help you? How many people are prepared to be in that situation? I think that's the really unfortunate part of all of this. And um, that was kind of our attempt to, to, to say one of the best things about the insurance is obviously that is somebody there that can that can kind of guide you through it because they've been through it before. And the last thing that the insurance may provide, uh, especially for high-profile restaurants or customers or high-profile individuals, you know, there is that threat of a, what we call fiber extortion. So they call you up and say, hey, you know what? I got I got all your data out of your system. Uh, did you pay us twenty thousand dollars, or it's all going to a black market? And that extortion is also something that's covered under our policy as well. So. Things that are covered through maybe risk management, preventative risk management, afterwards, buying a risk transfer certainly may cover some of those uh, losses as well. Excellent. So thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time. I know this was a thorough discussion. Now it's kind of the question and answer portion of it. If anybody has questions. I was curious whether or not you've been notified you've been hacked, you know you have a problem. To be, do the best you can do, should you shut down? I mean, should you quit using that system until all these people can do their investigating? So the question was, so everyone can hear, if we have been notified of a breach, uh, is the, the first best step to, to shut down and allow everyone to investigate and do their work? Um, I, I would I would say that uh, that it's certainly a, a technique to immediately stop the bleeding. Um, I would offer that uh, you know when it, sometimes uh, when we uh, when we law enforcement or uh, credit card company calls, uh, we may not know that that you've been breached. We may suspect you've been breached, and so what we're asking for at that point in time is to uh, to come in, and we're going to quickly come in and 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 check for for malware. You know, once we've confirmed there's malware on your system, then absolutely you need to, to stop the bleeding and use alternate methods. Um, but you know, something just to consider is is we may not we may not know initially. Having had a merchant that was hacked into two summers ago into his POS, these notified Harlan. They notified me. We notified the merchant right away, and so. We went in right away, and unfortunately, I didn't know about you, but we uh, <laughs> we determined that they'd been hacked into. So it's just like we told them right away, shut off. You're, you're using your POS right now, and I was able to provide this standalone credit card machines. But then about two days later, Visa determined that it, 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 the extent of it was it, it was so large that they couldn't process credit cards at all. So they put that terrible sign that says cash only. Right? You know, well, then the forensic investigators came to come out. The scary thing is this cost him a little bit over sixteen thousand dollars in the fines and the cost of the forensic investigators, and that's not the lost business either. And sure enough, he shut he closed down, I would say probably within about 120 days after that. And the biggest reason was is that he was like two software versions behind what his POS company was asking him, pretty much pleading with him that he didn't want to spend the money. And it's one of those things where I, I tell all my people that they have POS, when your POS guys contact you saying they want to either upgrade your server from Windows XP to Windows 7 or just go to the latest version of software, it may cost you money. That's cheap compared to what's going to cost you if the one you get hacked into. Yeah, I know. I know. On the, uh, I, I did a little research on the PF Chang. That was kind of the most prolific breach within our industry. Uh, they went to knuckle busters for 30 days. So, uh, and then 60 Minutes just did a piece on, on the Sony hack. 
Sony shut their entire network down for 30 days. So uh, I, I would say that's probably the most common response would be to shut everything down, uh, which is not always the best um, uh, for, for our businesses continuing. So, Sarah, I believe there's a question from. There is. Um, insurance question. Do the brands have any actual liability or is it all attributed to the issuing bank, processors, and merchants? It's where the breach happens. It's, it's the in, if, if it happens on your watch, then you're responsible. If it happens on Heartland's watch, and if Heartland systems are broken into, then they're responsible. But it's where the breach occurs is where that liability lies. And you can't transfer that to another entity. Um, another one, um, I mentioned RAM scrapers. Would a breach necessity taking the entire device offline or just the hard drive? So if, if, if they had a RAM scraper malware, would we be talking about taking the system offline or shutting the whole system down? Is that what I understand the question to be? Um, if you've got malware on your system, uh, you're going to have to take that offline. It's going to be the whole system coming offline. And once uh, the forensics is done, um, either by me or, or by somebody like Gabe, you know, just to capture that initial image, uh, then you know, you're going to have somebody else come in, or it could be Gabe, come in and to wipe your system, reinstall it, and, and start fresh. I have a couple other quick questions. Um, Gabe, you had mentioned um, people behavior as one of the risk management techniques. Have you seen or do you have any opinions on uh, policy, whether it's in a handbook policy or, or some type of written corporate uh, structure to how systems are used, how passwords are utilized. Um, do you recommend that? Is that, is oh, that a way to manage people? Can it be done successfully? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I've seen a lot of restaurants in, uh, including, included in their management training um, the basics, like who's allowed on the computers. Um, if I come in and say I'm, Com I'm with Comcast, CenturyLink, whomever, that doesn't mean that I could just get on the back of the house computer. Believe it or not, that that's, that's happened uh, last year. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are the written policies and signed off to make sure everybody understands who, who is allowed, who has access. Um, we alluded to the, um, the disgruntled employees. Um, it's important whether, you know, good or bad terms when they left, go ahead and just cancel that, that login, put login credentials, delete that access. So, yeah. Excellent. One other question. Uh, do you have another? No. Uh, James. Can you give me a ballpark? I'm a restaurant. I'm doing one and a half million in sales. Um, what might a cyber liability policy cost me? A million dollar cyber liability policy that includes third party and first party for about a million and a half revenue restaurant is about $1,500 $1, a year. Yeah, 1500 to 2000 a year. It's become very more affordable than it used to be. Um, just about five years ago, you were looking at between five to eight thousand a year. So it's become quite a bit more affordable, and you guys can you guys can choose and not choose certain coverages. So it's a very cafeteria type of a policy. You can say, okay, you know, we don't have a lot of third party exposure, but we may have a huge first party exposure. Then you can buy down your or calm down or bring down your limits on the third party, increase the limits on the first party. If you are really afraid of your employees and you can't trust them, maybe you want to increase, you know, <laughs> increase that liability just a little bit. So there are various, and if you're really high profile, maybe you really want a high limit on cyber extortion. So, I mean, there are so many things you can do with policies. Uh, and again, there are policies that will do limit maximums as a dollar maximum, and then there are policies that will do number of record maximums. Uh, we have one policy that will do up to like 500,000 records or up to a certain amount of records. And you can save them some money that way if you feel as though the number of records that go through your place isn't as big as that. All right, anything else? All right, well, we go ahead and thank um, all of our speakers. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> We're gonna just take a couple minutes here. Dana um, is here to do the drawing for us. Generously offered. So, um, if you want to speak for a couple minutes, and we'll do a quick drawing. And um, I know we're a little over time, so we'll we'll do something. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Dana Chavez, and I'm the partner, Colorado Credit Union. 
I work really closely with the Colorado Resident Association and business members. Uh, we provide services for you business owners and for your staff as well. Um, I did leave you some information on some of our uh, solutions that we offer. Um, one of the things that we're bringing online, uh, we have a mobile app for your, excuse me, to do mobile banking. And we're launching a new application in May. And what that is, is how many of you have ever misplaced your debit or your credit card for like 24 or 48 hours and you're panicked because I don't know where I left it? Well, our new application will have a feature that you can shut off your credit card from your phone and turn it back on if you find it. If you don't find it, then you can just report it lost your phone and replace the card altogether. Uh, that's how we're trying to stay ahead of the game and be innovative to help you as a consumer protect yourself. So thank you for your time. And Sarah, I'm going to have you draw this. This is for someone in this room. For a twenty-five dollar gift card. See that. All right, and then we're gonna do one for everybody that is there online. Okay, so online. Kim Payne. Great, and then we have one more bonus. Yeah, we do. This is for an iHome little station. Let me see if those of you have an iHome. That would be Scott Shit. Right. <laughs> and that is it for us. Thank All right. you. Again, thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to our speakers. Um, thank you, Partner Colorado Credit Union, and thank you, Pinnacle. Um, if you can just mark your calendars, the next uh, Food for Thought will be on Wednesday, May 27th, and we'll be talking about how to best to communicate to the media. When they show up at your door, how do you communicate to them? If you have something you're wanting to promote, how do you communicate to them? Um, so again, that will be Wednesday, May 27th, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much.